Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth day of our Triangle SciTech Expo, sponsored by Biogen Foundation and the NC Science Festival. My name is Hugo, and I'm going to be your host. And today is a special day. Yes, because we are celebrating the Earth Day. So we have a special programs all day, and you can check them out at naturalsciences.org. Um, while we are waiting for everybody to log in, I have a question for you guys. How are you helping the Earth? So what are the things that you are doing to help Earth? So yeah, please write them down on the chat, and we can read the answers. And while we're waiting for those answers, um, oh, we are getting some. So Skelly said, I try to recycle materials in water, which is good. And while we are, uh, yeah, same question. So uh, while we're waiting for those uh, answers, I'm going to introduce or talk in or experts at the talk this morning is sustainable agriculture, and we all play a part. In our expert is Dr. Stephen Wall. Stephen works for Syngenta in Research Triangle Park here in North Carolina, where he is the development manager for sustainable response, uh, sustainable responsible business team. He works on a wide variety of sustainability projects for his company. So good morning, Stephen, and thank you for being with us today to celebrate Earth. Yeah, hey, Hugo, excited to be here. I, I really appreciate you inviting me to off the series of talks on Earth Day. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so what do you think about these answers, like recycling materials and water, composting food scraps and, and waste? Those, those are, are those are actions. Those are great, yeah, great things to be doing, I think. Yeah, some of the stuff I like to do as well, but all of that's really good stuff. Yeah, hopefully we'll get some more answers coming in too. Great, so I think that it's time to start, so we can wait to see what you have prepared for us. So take it away. All right. So, go. How are we doing there, Hugo? Can, can we see that? Yes. Okay, great. So, yeah, thanks everyone. As, as Hugo mentioned, my name is Stephen Wall. I work for a company called Senta, which is based here in Research Triangle Park. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit about sustainable agriculture and how we can all play a part. So I'm going to give sort of a high level overview of what sustainable ag is, some of the key benefits associated with it. And importantly, like some similar talks you're going to hear later on today about climate, how sustainable ag can help mitigate climate change. So that's sort of a key piece of it these days as well. So I really like um, Hugo's opening question of, of what can we do to help the earth? What are we all doing? It's this time of year around Earth Day that I tend to think a lot about pollen. So there's the pollen in the, that make the green clouds you see everywhere, the pollen that ends up on my car, the pollen that ends up on my puppy. But actually, the kind I'm talking about is pollen that comes from native wildflowers. So what I like to do is, um, the past several years, I've planted a lot of native uh, wild, wildflower flower plants, if I could speak, in my backyard. So these are these are plants that have, are native to North Carolina or the southeast and really attracted to pollinators. So they're starting to pop up lately. Um, and so about another month or so, start to see some great wildflowers in my backyard that are really attractive to all sorts of pollinators, bees, wasps, butterflies, birds, and it's just a great way to sort of experience a bit of nature in your backyard and really sort of contribute to overall biodiversity for the earth. So that's kind of what I like to do um, as one thing is how I can contribute to the earth and birds day. So um, a little bit about Syngenta. Um, so we're an agricultural company and we want to help challenges that farmers face. So there are about two and a half billion people in the world that depend on agriculture for a living. So a really sizable portion of the population directly depends on agriculture. And they face a variety of challenges every year, every day. So they have to grow more crops while using less inputs like water, um, trying to use, reduce their water use. They have to cope with all the volatile weather that we see. We see a lot of that in the news these days. So whether it's a flood or a drought or a snowstorm in April, whatever it might be. Um, and then we as consumers, we're always changing our taste. 
always changing our diet. I mean, who would have guessed 10 years ago that we would all love cauliflower and kale these days. So farmers have to be able to respond to those sort of changing demands and what we want to see in the grocery stores and on our plates. There's also an increasing demand for more high quality food, which is a, a great thing is, is being, the, being able to have fresh, safe food um, on our plates. And they have to be able to adopt to new technologies that are constantly evolving, constantly changing. Um, like a lot of the digital technologies that we see every day as consumers, Farmers have to be able to adjust and adopt to those um, new technologies as well. And they need to be able to constantly invest in their farms to make them more productive. So you can't just always have the same thing happen every year. You gotta be able to constantly invest in it, be able to meet, meet demands for the next year. And then really key and important is passing on a passion for farming to the next generation. So farmers out there, they're excited about what they do. They're passionate about what they do. They want to make sure that the people that are going to farm that land in the next generation have that equal passion and excitement as well. And sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. So yeah, so there's just a whole lot of challenges that we want to help try to address here at Syngenta. And so um, we focus on, on all sorts of farmers, right? So farmers that's, that are large scale farms. So those that farm maybe 50 acres or more and a whole lot of small upholder farms, which are mainly um, outside the U.S., but those are that farm about four acres or less. So we focus on a wide range of scales there, and we want to play a vital role in, in food, um, in the food chain and helping to safely feed the world and really take care of our planet. So we're, um, we're based in about 90 countries. Um, we have about 90 production and supply sites spread all over the globe. Uh, one of those is here in, um, well, actually several are here in, in the U.S. Um, we have a, about 100 and over 100 research and development sites. The one I mentioned here in RTP is one of our seeds R&D sites, which is where I work. And we have about 28,000 employees spread across the globe. And so one of our big aims is really to improve the sustainability, quality, and safety of agriculture. So that's really a key thing for us and really defines a lot of who we are. And speaking of sustainability, um, we have our own sort of sustainability blueprint, which we call the Good Growth Plan. And I'll talk about that later on in, in the presentation towards the end, but it's really sort of a way that we try to think about how we operate as a company but really also about how we can best serve the agricultural industry to make sure that we're really a big component in helping um, sustainable agriculture. So um, I'm gonna try this out and hopefully it works. If not, we'll just move on, Hugo. Uh, but this is sort of an interactive word cloud generator. So I've thrown out the word sustainability a couple of times now, but if you could uh, go to either scan that QR code with your phone or go to the website, slido.com, and it'll pop up and you can type in that code 6100. And then in one word, if you could describe what sustainability means to you, I think that would be kind of an interesting way to see what you guys think about it before we start talking about agriculture. And also, as you're doing that, if you could just leave that page open, um, there'll be another little um, interactive quiz kind of thing later on in the presentation, and it'll automatically roll over to that. So maybe we'll see how that works and give that a second. Yeah, so yeah. now that we're getting virtual, so grab your phones, take a picture, open your, your camera and take a picture of that QR code and write your answer and keep it open because this is going to be refreshing with every question so that you can participate easily. Okay. So there's one in there so far future. Yeah, that's a really great one. And that certainly talks about the sort of future generations and, and what we need to be thinking about. Hope, oh, I like that one. That one's great. Yeah, conservation's a really good one too. Another future. So yeah, and that, that future thing sort of speaks a little bit to the, the photo associated with my presentation, which shows sort of a, a multi-generational family there in, in a farmer's field. Um, it talks a lot about, about sort of the, the current farmer who is the dad and, and the mom and, and the child and trying to keep that sort of that agriculture or passion, that excitement going so that they are, are there in the same field uh, later on 
as the years go by as well. So yeah, those are all really great answers. Um, and we'll just, just to sort of keep going with time a little bit, I think we'll go ahead and move on, but appreciate your interaction so far. And again, if you'll just keep that open, there'll be another one coming up here in a few minutes that, that you can contribute to as well. So sort of a, a definition of sustainable agriculture really as it relates to modern agriculture, it surrounds words that start with P. So there's basically four P's. Uh, the first one being production. So um, production meaning the yield that you produce, the crop yield that you produce on the farm needs to meet today's needs, but also be able to improve the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So it's really sort of being able to produce what we need now, but being able to meet uh, the needs for future generations as well. So that's certainly a, a key one as far as production. Another one that's really important, especially since we're talking about Earth Day, is, is the planet. So that's really about environmental stewardship and being able to safeguard the environment, um, being able to safeguard that land so that it remains, um, that you're not doing any harm and you're actually improving the environment that you're farming on. Another one, another one of the P's is people, uh, and that's ensuring social responsibility and equity across the entire food chain. So not just for farmers, not just for consumers, but the folks that package all the food that we eat, the people in the grocery stores that put it on the shelves, that entire food chain, uh, we need to make sure that it, it is being performed socially in a socially responsible way and also equitable across everybody. And then the, the other one is, is profit. So that's about economic viability. So a farmer needs to be able to make decisions today that puts money in their pocket tomorrow or next year so that they can provide for themselves and their families, but also that they can protect the livelihoods of future generations and they can really ensure the long-term financial stability of that farm. So that economic piece is really important as well. So really, uh, the way we think about it a bit within our company is really sort of three P's, but it's actually four P's. So it's production, planet, people, and profit is sort of a, an, an easy way to sort of remember sort of the basics about um, some of the elements of sustainable agriculture. So um, I'm going to show a little video here, and this is from the USDA, and it sort of gives an overview of, of sustainable agriculture. And so we'll just let that run here. How do you make a farm or ranch more sustainable? There's no single answer, but there are common practices used by producers across the country to improve profitability, quality of life, and environmental stewardship. In this episode, let's look at what it means to be sustainable and how this looks across an entire farm or ranch. Farmers and ranchers who prioritize sustainability aim to produce enough food, fuel, and fiber to meet today's needs without compromising our ability to do so tomorrow. While we use different practices that work best on our unique farms and ranches, we all share this same vision. We also view our farm or ranch as a holistic system and we look for ways to improve our farm's overall health and resilience. So practices that are considered sustainable should meet four criteria. They're productive, they're profitable, they enhance the quality and abundance of our natural resources, and they improve quality of life for our families and communities. We find ways to work with nature when raising crops and livestock by focusing on things like biodiversity, soil health, ecological pest management, and water conservation. We use practices like crop rotation, cover crops, rotational grazing, and locally adapted breeds and resistant varieties. We lower our use of tillage and chemical inputs as much as possible. Sustainable practices are also profitable, usually because they improve our efficiency with resources. We're creating a productive growing environment that uses fewer purchased inputs. We strive to be good marketers, and we seek out value-added strategies to increase profits. 
We sell our products through multiple channels and engage with communities to meet the demand for local foods and better ensure that all people can access healthy food. We need to consider the people who are growing our food too. Sustainability involves focusing on the health and well-being of ourselves, our families, and our workers. And we look to the future by actively encouraging the next generation of farmers. Farmers who prioritize sustainability are always trying to find new ways to solve problems and build resilient systems. That's why many of us collaborate with our peers and extension professionals to conduct on-farm research. There's much more to learn about sustainable agriculture. Start exploring today. How do you make a farm or ranch more sustainable? There There's no. So, yeah, so that so that presentation, that video um, talked about a few things that we'd already talked about. Uh, we talked about some of the practices that we'll dig into here in just a minute. But here's a little factoid for you. Did you know that it can take more than 500 years to form two centimeters of new topsoil? So 500 years to produce just maybe less than an inch of new topsoil, which that's a long time, right? And every year, though, throughout the world, we lose about 30 million acres of soil um, through drought, drought and desertification. That's about 60 acres a minute. I mean, that, that's a ton of soil loss. And on that soil, we could have produced about 20 million tons of grains. It sort of shows you how important it is to take care of that soil. And that's the big thing with sustainable agriculture, just promoting and improving soil health. So that's a really um, key topic when we talk about sustainable ag. So... Some of the common practices that that video just talked about and really some of the real common practices within sustainable ag cover cover these, these items listed on your left. And I'll talk about a few of those here on this slide. Tillage is a really big one. So if you go down to the bottom left corner into that image, you'll see a field that says no-till and conventional with conventional on the right. And um, if you look at that, that's typically maybe what we think about when we think about a farmer that would go out and plow their field. They may have a nice clean field that they can then go in and plant their, their crop into. Um, and that's a traditional way to do that, to do this type of farming. But over the past many years, 10, 20 years really, um, there's been a sort of migration, a shift to no-till, at least where it makes sense for that farmer. And basically what that means is that every fall when farmer harvests his crop, they leave plant residue on that field. So basically they leave crop stubble, some green matter, whatever that might be on their field um, and they leave that throughout the winter and then they come back the next year uh, in the spring and they go and they plant directly into that plant residue that's left on the field. So basically the, the soil is covered with plant material throughout the year and that really helps erosion or water holding capacity which is basically the ability for the soil to hold water and maintain water. Um, it can uh, decrease nitrogen use. There's all sorts of really great benefits associated with that. No-till isn't the only um, tillage type practice that you can use to get sustainable ag. It just really illustrates sort of maybe a difference between conventional and no-till. So that's a, that's a big one that we always talk about, a tillage. Another one that's become increasingly popular is cover crop. So in that top right image, you'll see a, a field of wheat and then there's a bunch of green plants in there. And that's a cover crop that was planted into this field of wheat before it gets harvested. And it sort of serves a similar purpose to the no-till field in that it, um, it has sort of a green cover on it throughout the year. So maybe, so some people call it a continuous living cover system. So you have, you plant your crop in the spring, you harvest it in the fall, you plant your cover crop that grows um, throughout the fall and into the winter. And then it's there in the spring when you go back in and, and plant your crop. And you have to sort of get rid of that cover crop through some sort of way to get rid of it. Through A lot of it can die over the winter or sometimes you have to spray it. But it provides that sort of continuous cover on the field that, again, has lots of really great benefits to the soil from building up organic matter, water, nitrogen, 
soil loss, all those really good things. And another real popular one is, is rotation of crops. So the picture on the bottom right shows plastic rotation in the Midwest, which is soybeans and corn. So you plant soybeans on the field one year, the next year you plant corn. And this sort of rotation, it has a lot of benefits for the soil and also a lot of benefits for um, helping with weed management. So trying to keep your weeds down, it's, uh, crop rotation is a really good one for that. And some folks these days actually integrate livestock into their practice as well. So maybe in their cover crop, they plant something that if you're, if you're raising cattle, if you're raising a cow, uh, that is a cow can go out and forage on. So they can go out and eat that, eat that cover crop during the winter and those cows can move around the field and it provides a lot of benefits um, to, to those fields. One of those being sort of a natural fertilizer that you're going to get out of rotating your cows around. So these are just some of the really common practices that are associated with sustainable ag. It certainly isn't all of them, but it's, it's, it's kind of the big ones that most people tend to talk about when we think about sustainable agriculture. And when it comes to sustainable ag, it's really important to measure things. So if we don't know what, uh, if, we, if we don't measure what we think we're trying to, to have as far as an outcome, then it's kind of hard to tell whether or not we're having that outcome. So these are a variety of different things that people measure and some of the key outcomes associated with sustainable agriculture. Some of those we've already talked about with productivity, profitability, there's the water use piece, there's the nitrogen use piece. When it comes to climate, we tend to think about what, how we can limit greenhouse gas emissions off of a field, um, how we can reduce our energy use, our energy intensity associated with those farming operations, and also how we can actually sequester carbon in the soil. That is, how can we actually get carbon out of the atmosphere into the plant and into the soil and keep it there. So sort of a soil carbon capture. Um, how can we improve that in agriculture? We'll talk about that associated with climate here in a little bit. And then some of those other things I've already mentioned, like soil loss, uh, biodiversity, both above the ground, sort of the things that you're going to see buzzing around or living above the ground, but also below the ground, There's earthworms or all the microbial communities that are in soil. Soil is a big living organism. So there's lots of things going on below ground that's alive. And then improving water quality is another one as well. So those are just some of the key things that we try to measure and that we want to see as outcomes of these sustainable agricultural practices. And it really all comes down to healthy soils. Uh, all this is really geared towards benefiting soil. So we've already talked about all these about biodiversity, improving profitability, mitigating climate change, um, improving nutrient use efficiency, so being able to use less nitrogen uh, reducing soil loss, improving air and water quality, and increasing water retention. So those are a lot of the really key benefits you see when you use these practices over time, and it really sort of help, helps build that soil health. So these are this is a lot of, of what's associated with sustainable agriculture. So Hugo, I'm going to pause there and see if we have any questions. Sure. So first of all, I have to say that it's great that you talk about these three Ps because sometimes for us it's too easy to go to the store and grab our, our veggies. So that we sometimes that we don't think about all the process that is behind that. So that we don't think about the health of the soil, that it needs to be healthy, the people that is taking care of this food, even the packaging, and they have to live. So that is great. So we have um, questions from the chat. So one is, is there any downside to spraying a field to get rid of the no-till green cover? Is there any downside? Um, I, well, I mean, so I don't think there's, there, no, I don't think there's any downside. Uh, when you think about that sort of practice, um, ideally you'd want to have a crop in, a cover crop in there that will naturally die over the winter so you'll have a winter kill so the the cold temperatures will kill off that cover crop so that it's not there and doesn't compete as a weed uh the following season um if that if that doesn't happen going in and, and having having a spray um to, to get rid of that cover crop isn't a bad thing um unless you're doing organic agriculture uh you know, using chemicals on fields is a common practice, and most folks in a no-till situation, they'll need to sort of get rid of some weeds anyway um, 
in order to have a have a good good system so that they can go in and plan into and they're not going to have a lot of competition from weeds in that crop. Mm -hmm. And um, mostly these years, so people is uh, working on their own gardens. So I have a couple of questions from Miranda and Ryan. So do any of these practices translate well into small scale home gardens? And do you have any tips for making a garden? Yeah, and that's actually something I'm gonna come around to at the very end. But yeah, a lot of these practices um, translate to a home garden, depending on how big of that garden is, right? But if you think about um, things like nutrient management, okay, so, that's one thing that I talked about. So farmers typically, a lot, some farmers are able to use natural, you know, organic manures to put on in their fields. Some folks need to use um, some form of fertilizer. So that's all about nitrogen that helps plants grow. One thing that we can do at home is compost. So if you're able to compost all of your food waste, all of your garden waste, um, and create that nice rich compost that you can put into your garden, that's really a big source of nitrogen. That's, that's certainly one thing. If you think about being able to, depending on, again, how big that garden is, uh, but if you're able to keep some sort of mulch um, on that garden before your plants get big enough. So I like to grow tomatoes. So when those tomatoes are young, I like to, I like to maybe put a little bit of mulch on the surface of the garden uh, just to keep down weed pressure to help with water retention um, so we don't have to water as much. That's the type of thing that on a small scale that's in your garden, but on a large scale is that sort of no-till or continuous cover type system that, that farmers can use. So those are just a couple of really practical examples that we can use at home that um, large scale farmers use as well. Okay. So okay. All right. So you can keep going. Yeah. Great. Okay, so um, get my clicks going here. There we go. So as I mentioned, um, here's another uh, question for you guys. So I talked a little bit about greenhouse gases. So um, again, if you can go back to Slido and, and cast your vote on the biggest contributor to greenhouse gases out of these voices, uh, it'd be interesting to see what you guys think. So... Did you use your phone and answer that question? So we see transportation and electricity. Yeah. And there's certainly, you know, more categories to this, but these are sort of some of the big buckets associated with greenhouse gases. Oh, now electricity is, is winning. Yeah, I think that people think that electricity is the one. Looks like, yeah. Yeah. There's some more. Oh. And industry just coming into the game. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay, so yeah. So actually, um, this is from the US EPA, and this is from 2018. But when you look at greenhouse gas emissions, transportation barely is ahead of electricity. And transportation, you know, is really fossil fuels, right? It's really gas and oil that we burn to make our cars go and our buses go and, and all that. And then we have electricity and industry in there as well. And they're all really pretty close. And if you put those three sectors together, that makes up almost 80% of greenhouse gas emissions um, within the U.S. And that's really due to fossil fuel use. The vast majority of that is okay. So, uh, so if you think about it, those are really the big contributors to greenhouse gases, at least in the U.S. and probably globally as well. And you'll see agriculture makes up about ten percent of that, but we tend to focus a lot on greenhouse gases these days in agriculture and how agriculture can help mitigate some of those emissions. And so, why do we do that? So, agriculture is really one of the new front lines in the war on climate change. And this statistic says about 12% of all greenhouse gas emissions worldwide compared to that 10% number in uh, for the U.S. So it's pretty similar. But yeah, agriculture contributes about 12% of greenhouse gas emissions. So it isn't the biggest contributor, but it certainly is something that we can, somewhere we can do something about. So through better land use, we can lock more carbon into the soil. 
So taking carbon out of the atmosphere, put it, putting it into the soil is, is a huge thing. Uh, by making our practices in agriculture more efficient, having more efficient supply chains, we can start to cut our carbon intensities. And also there's a lot of um, technological innovation that's going on out there right now. So any, all those new technologies, and business models, it can really provide some big step changes in greenhouse gas production. And by working together with um, people like Syngenta, farmers, all of our partners, we can really sort of start to multiply the positive impact of our work. So agriculture and climate change is um, a really common uh, thing to be thinking about these days. It's a really um, popular topic in the world of agriculture. So it's this, this is actually can be simple, but it's actually pretty complex as this part of the shows. But when we think about trying to get carbon into the soil, the way that happens on a farm is all those plants out there through the photosynthesis they use to create energy for the plant, it pulls carbon out of the atmosphere and it puts it in and migrate down through the roots and put it into the soil. And there's a lot of different carbon cycles that go on associated with that. But simplistically, plants can take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil. So the trick though is trying to keep that carbon into the so in, in the soil and leave it there for a long period of time so that it doesn't go back up into the atmosphere. And that's a lot of sustainable agricultural practice can contribute to that. So if you're not going in and tilling your field every year, you're actually not putting that carbon back into the atmosphere. So that's a really, really big thing in trying to store, store some of this soil carbon. Also livestock producers, you know, we've got a cow here in the middle, uh, cows that burp, they, they tend to put a lot of CO2 out. And also you get methane coming out the other end that also puts carbon into the atmosphere. And there's a lot of technologies associated with that that are helping to sort of reduce those sort of livestock emissions as well. So again, when we think about carbon in agriculture, it's really just trying to get those plants to get it into the soil and, and, and farming practices to keep it into the soil as long as possible. And so this is a slide um, from a calculation from a, a group called Climate Central. And basically it says from North Carolina, the maximum CO2 uptake, the maximum carbon uptake by soils on a yearly basis would be about 2.64 million tons. Okay, we, we may not ever achieve that number, but what does really 2.64 million tons of CO2 mean? So if we start thinking about it in, in terms we probably understand, me certainly, is that... Um, that's about the amount of electricity that could be used uh, for 390,000 homes. So the amount of CO2 that's emitted to power 390,000 tons to be stored in the soil through agriculture. And it's also equivalent to 550,000 cars. So that's a lot of cars on the road every year. So all, the, all that CO2 coming out of the car, again, that's how much soil, how much carbon we could store in the soil in North Carolina uh, through some of these uh, agricultural practices that we've been talking about. And so I've got another video for you. And this is a great guy named Trey Hill up in, in Maryland. And he's going to talk a little bit about why he practices sustainable farming and also some of the digital tools that he uses to really help improve his farm and help improve his sustainable practices and the way he farms in all of his different fields. <laughs> Harborview Farms is a large-scale family farm. We grow corn, wheat, soybeans, and barley, and we produce it all here on the eastern shore on the banks of the Chesapeake Bay and some of its tributaries. My grandfather started the farm, or my great-grandfather, I think, actually started it. Uh, so my grandfather and then my father really grew it in the 70s and 80s. Uh, we have a team of about 12 folks that work with us. We practice a lot of climate-friendly or carbon-smart farming. Um, and what that is, it's really quite simple. We don't till the ground. We never turn the soil over and expose the soil to the, to the air because what that does is that releases the carbon. And then by not turning the soil over, that carbon is then stored in the soil. So what that's doing is it's helping mitigate climate change, but more importantly for me, it's building soil. It's building the organic matter in my soil. It's building soils back up in the way nature intended so that the soils will be better as we progress. So even though we're taking off crops of corn and soybeans, we're actually seeing increases in organic matter, which gives me better water holding capacity. So it started a long time ago with cover crops where the environmental community in Maryland wanted us to grow cover crops in order to pull up the excess nutrients in the wintertime. And we did that uh, for years. 
And as we did it, we started to see the soil get healthier. We saw our soil starting to build up. We weren't 100% no-till. We were still doing occasional tillage, but still our soils were, were getting more alive. So as we started to implement all these practices, we didn't realize it, but they were running directly in parallel with climate mitigation. We've just gone up leaps and bounds over the last decade. Just the amount of technology being thrown at us is unbelievable. In fact, we even get a news feed that shows what everyone's doing at all times. When we go to scout, everyone can see what everyone's doing. So what I call it is kind of a collective intellect. Now that a lot of the technology is coming out, it all works. You know, our combines that you see behind us, they talk to one another. So when we pull into a field, you wouldn't think it, but knowing which line that combine is driving itself down, they all have GPS guidance. Well, if they don't communicate, you don't know the right angle to go harvest the field. I have a satellite image of the field telling me the health of the crop as it's growing. Well, now we can pinpoint areas that are of concern in real time. So we look at the map, we see where we might have a crop health issue um, based on an algorithm that knows whether it's soil type or whether it's an actual issue. Go out, scout it, pull a leaf sample, figure out if it's nutrient deficiency, is it disease, is it insects, and then we go and we can spray and we can address the situation. If we can be part of the solution to climate change and feed people, I think it's a, just a tremendous opportunity. Okay, cool. So Trey's just one of the farmers out there that uses sustainable agriculture practices, and um, there's lots of other folks that, are, that have started on this. Um, again, over the past 10 to 20 years, sustainable ag isn't really new, uh, but certainly has become more popular recently. So Hugo, I'm going to pause again to see if there's any questions out there before I move into the last part of my presentation. Sure. So we have a question from Sarah. So can you talk about what kinds of climates and geographic features make it more difficult to create sustainable soil? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so yeah, I mean, so sustainable, sustainable ag practices and that contribute to soil, they're not possible everywhere. So um, places that are, are naturally have less moisture, um, maybe more difficult uh, with certain soil types. Um, you know, here in North Carolina, it's not, we don't have to dig down too far before we get to a lot of clay, um, a lot of hard pan that can limit um, the amount of water that gets infiltrated further down into the soil and limits the amount of topsoil we may have. So uh, that's certainly, you know, sandy soils as well. So there's lots of different soil types that it's, it's more difficult to build up a good, rich, healthy soil, but it's not impossible. And certainly all these sustainable practices really sort of help benefit uh, that topsoil and really contribute to the healthiness of that soil. And it just it just takes time. It takes a lot of time in some places compared to others to build up that real healthy soil. And it kind of just depends on different parts of the country that you're, that you're in. Um, but certainly it, it's not possible everywhere, but in the majority of places it, it does help build up that soil health. Mm -hmm. And thinking about this past year that um, because of all this global situation, we didn't use a lot of cars and all that stuff. Do you think that we are going to see a consequence because of that, like the soil is going to be healthier because all those gases the last year that we didn't add them to, to the soil? Yeah, no. So I think I think that's and that's great for overall carbon emissions, right? Um, and we certainly I don't I haven't seen the data lately, but if you look at say where we were in 2019 versus the end of 2020, carbon emissions uh, definitely went down through less people driving, less people, less industry, less people um, being out and about. All sorts of different reasons for that for for carbon emissions globally going down. Um, does, does, did that have an impact on the soil? Um, I mean, the soil and plants still captured all that carbon that's still out, out there. So there's still surplus of carbon in the atmosphere. Um, and it, you know, so the plants kept doing what they do through photosynthesis last year as well. And I think it was our own emissions that probably contributed a greater amount or lack of emissions that contributed a greater amount rather than sort of agriculture doing anything different. So um, hopefully, you know, those trends will continue, but, but we'll see as far as trying, is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And Miranda has a comment that she almost bought a small tiller because she wanted to add nutrients to her jar, but happy to hear that she can 
keep saving that money. <laughs> no, and I understand tillers. Yes, sometimes it's it's yeah level of effort, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Well, this last little bit um, is just to really talk a bit about Syngenta and the Good Growth Plan. And um, so again, I'm very hot on videos for this presentation, but I've got one more quick video and then I'll wrap up with a couple of comments. And this is just a little bit about what Syngenta does as far as technology and, and how we want to be able to help sustainable ag. Syngenta is Research and development at Syngenta, sustainability is central to our innovation. Our journey is from planet to product. Our world is facing many challenges. Around the globe, societies have changing expectations for how their food is produced. These expectations need to be met by farmers who face many challenges of their own. Through world-class research, our scientists accelerate innovation to create novel, sustainable products for healthy crops. These new solutions help to protect our water, soil and biodiversity by applying the latest scientific understanding of the environment. So what is our sustainable innovation all about? Simple. It centers on our three sustainability levers. Respect, reward, reduce. Respect is about respecting our biodiversity and soil health. Maintaining these is critical for a healthy environment and productive agriculture. Reward is about offering sustainable solutions that benefit farmers and society. Agriculture offers one of the few opportunities to capture carbon from the atmosphere in plants and soil, thereby reducing greenhouse gases. By making farms more efficient and profitable, the surrounding communities and local economies also benefit. Reduce is about reducing inputs and waste so that we use less resources to grow crops. This means looking for more precise, targeted solutions that use fewer resources like nutrients, water and energy. Our inventions enable farmers to be more efficient, minimizing chemical residues and greenhouse gases. As we look to the future, the promise of sustainable innovation is exciting. Our talented teams strengthen our understanding of current and future grower needs. We put these in the context of our three sustainability levers to guide our research. However, achieving these goals is not simple. It takes everyone in research and development, agronomists, chemists, biologists, technologists, working together to solve problems. We do this with a diversity of technologies to advance science and help farmers with the complex decisions they have to make. Our innovation enables farmers to produce healthy, sustainable food while satisfying regulatory requirements and meeting the needs of society and our planet. In an unprecedented time, we are offering solutions. Join us on our sustainable innovation journey. Okay, so as I mentioned at the beginning, we have sort of a sustainability blueprint called the Good Growth Plan. It's really just a set of commitments that we've made um, to do a number of things. One of those is trying to get a major reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, mitigate the effects of climate change. And we, so we, started, uh, we started this about 10 years ago with our first Good Growth Plan, just recently built on that um, and renewed some of our commitments around biodiversity and farmer safety. And it kind of comes down into four buckets. It's around innovation. It's around trying to get carbon neutral agriculture, trying to go to a net positive so that we're storing more carbon in the soil than agriculture emits, helping people stay safe and healthy and, and really about partnership. So some of those commitments specifically around innovation are investment in sustainable ag breakthroughs, um, bringing two new sustainable tech breakthroughs per year to the market. Um, being able to measure and enable carbon capture and mitigate it in agriculture, biodiversity, I keep mentioning. So every every year we, we make sure that we're um, improving biodiversity on at least 3 million hectares of land every year and really reducing our carbon intensity through our operations by 50% by 2030. Um, on the safety side, it's really, again, it's about social responsibility. It's making sure our people stay safe and healthy and those that, that work around us as well in the supply chain, stay safe and healthy. 
And then we have a lot of partnerships that we've built um, to really get those step changes, those multipliers in place. So it's not just Syngenta trying to do it. We have a big partnership, a big coalition of people going for the same goal. So hopefully using all these things, we really sort of will hit that carbon neutral agriculture to the point in the future. Um, and this slide just basically says, uh, we're doing this in a transparent way. So we don't just say these things, we hold ourselves accountable through some science organizations that we're involved with, through reporting on this on an annual basis and having those results audited. So those are all always publicly so that's sort of a real quick wrap up of the good growth plan as far as intent goes. And some of this is, you know, directly related to sustainable ag and how we are contributing to that. So um, this is just my, my final wrap up slide here. And, and we had the question earlier about, you know, some of the things that we could do in our home gardens um, that relates to sustainable ag. And I mentioned, you know, getting your hands in the dirt, understanding what it takes to build a healthy soil, understanding what it takes to grow a seed, um, grow a plant uh, in a fruit, maybe from a seed, growing that great tomato from a seed or seedling and understanding what that takes. Being able to go out and, you know, limit your own food waste, do some composting to help build up that healthy soil in your garden. Those sorts of things give you a better understanding of sustainable agriculture on maybe your own personal scale, but then a better understanding of what it's going to take on a large scale to produce that tomato that you see on the grocery store shelf instead of the one that you're producing in your garden. And chances are the one in your garden is going to taste better. But that said, um, you'll have a better understanding of, of what it takes to get there. And as I mentioned, me, for me personally early on, it's about promoting biodiversity as well. It's about going out there and planting some native plants and native wildflowers that you can, you can have those pollinators come and visit. Have those monarchs come visit on your milkweed plant this year. I'm looking forward to that. That happens for me every year. And seeing some of those hummingbirds around your, your flowers and bird feeders. So, all these things um, contribute to sustainable agriculture on your own small scale, but also clearly on a broader scale as well. So we all do have a role in it. And so I really appreciate your time today. And with that, um, I'm going to wrap up, Hugo. And if there's any other questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm so happy to, to see that Syngenta is, is taking care of the planet and, and all the work that, that you're doing. So we have some... Um, students on our audience and I would love you to talk about your path. So what was your path till you get in here? What are your your inspiration and how did you get into the things that you're doing? Yeah, no, great question. So, okay, yeah, so as you guys, you mentioned, I, I have a doctorate. So I started out as an environmental ecologist, so basically studying, studying the effects of different chemicals on the environment. I was a fish guy, so I was looking at fish. Um, and then I got a job at Syngenta well over 20 years ago, and I've been here ever since. So I've held a variety of roles in the company, all of those, most of those related to environmental safety of our products. Um, more recently, say within the past four or five years, I was working on some new technologies and really started thinking really heavily about sustainability and how um, the technology I was working on could really help contribute to sustainable agriculture. I just kind of got interested in it at that point. And then even more recently, um, Syngenta's had this big push towards sustainable agriculture, towards helping mitigate climate change. So all that, so I was sort of primed with that interest um, with the company position on where we are. And so I've just sort of gotten into it out of interest. Um, and it's extremely interesting to me. And, and it's really sort of a passionate thing for me these days is sustainable ag. So it just sort of kind of grew naturally for me as, as I work within the company. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's just sort of a, a, a natural evolution um, is how that worked out for me. Mm -hmm. And today we are celebrating the Earth Day and the things that we can do just to help this planet. Um, if you have to give an advice or one thing, at least do, think, do this to help the planet, what will be your suggestion, your advice? Yeah, so maybe a couple of things. I think one is just sort sort of um, do something yourself. Um, start out on a small scale. You don't have to tackle tackle. You don't have to tackle everything. Um, start, you know, go out and plant a plant. Um, grow a tomato. Compost. Simple things like that on a small scale. But also just educate yourself. Um, understand 
more about agriculture, understand what it takes to grow food, understand why certain practices work for some people, but they don't work for, for everybody. Agriculture certainly isn't a one size fits all. Um, every, every field has its own challenges. Every farmer has its own challenges. So, so that's just a couple of things. Do something yourself um, is one, but educate yourself is, is the other on, on agriculture is what I would say. Yeah, that, that is important. So um, if they want, so if people want to know more about Syngenta and the work that you're doing, where they should go? Yeah. Um, more information. It, yeah, a couple of places. One is um, if you just go to Syngenta US, we'll have some stuff on sustainable agriculture there. If you go to, there's also a different address called Syngenta Group. Uh, if you Google that, there will be other things about Syngenta and sustainable ag there. Or if you just want to learn more about Syngenta, either of those two sites will tell you who about, tell you more about who we are and, and what we do. Okay. So thank you, Stephen. This presentation was great and we and we have learned a lot. But sadly that we don't have more time because this was the first program, but not the last one. So we have tons of programs for today to celebrate the Earth Day. So check them out at naturalsciences.org. And I wanted to thank you, our sponsors, Biogen and the North Carolina Science Festival. And of course, you two for attending this program. Um, and just a quick uh, reminder, if you're a member, thank you so much for being a friend of the museum because your support let us create program and events like this one. But if you are not, maybe this is a chance for you to join. So again, thank you, Stephen. And thank you, everybody. And I hope to see you in another presentation. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Happy Earth Day. Thanks, everybody.